Welcome back to another episode from Tailors with Love. Today we're talking about Goodfellas from 1990, directed by Martin Scorsese. The costume designer for this was Richard Bruno. His filmography boasts of Chinatown, Westworld, and Untouchables, to name a few. He's sadly no longer with us. He died in 2012 at the age of 87. Rotten Tomatoes has this film, 96% with the critics, 97% with the audience, so universally loved. And uh, joining me today to talk about Goodfellas is a gentleman who was also mobbed by a group of Italian men when he lost his cherry, Nick Guzan from Bamp Style. How are you doing today, Nick? Doing great, thanks. Appreciate that intro. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, on line two, we have a gentleman whose mum wished he dressed like a gangster. Ken Stoffer, how are we doing today, Ken? Good, good, Pete. Good to see you. Good to see you, pal. Ken runs uh, the account Oceanographer. I'm sure you guys will remember, and he's done some great work um, writing over on Nick's site, so you can catch up with some of that over there. But, gents, uh, Nick, first off, let's, uh, let's talk about some of the articles you've written on your site. Uh, it was great actually researching the show. I just pretty much... <laughs> sat down for about two hours and read about 15, 20 articles on your site. So um, in terms of the era that this film was set in, how do these suits and clothes best reflect what was happening at the time stylistically? Yeah, I think uh, it's interesting because the, yeah, the story is presented. So from 1955 through 1980. So it seems like we're really seeing like three primary eras in uh, clothing there. You know, the first is the 50s, lots of opulence, silk suits, camp shirts, knits, uh, tons of jewelry, of course, vivid colors. It seems like the, uh, it's like the mob's version of like that, that post-war boom. Uh, you know, the, it was rather than the man in the gray flannel suit, it's the man in the gray silk suit with a pinky ring. Um, but yeah, it's like this is where Scorsese also introduces right off the bat that classic, the good fella collar, which I still have yet to see in the wild. Um, that, you know, that almost dangerously sharp spear point collar, uh, barely any tie space there. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, in, in fact, I think some of Joe Pesci's collars there later seem to almost have like overlapping points with the tie yeah. not non-existent under that. Um, and then, yeah, we get into the 60s, which is more like an extension of that, uh, especially the scenes in the early 60s where these once teenage wise guys like Henry and Tommy are starting to really dress like their mentors. You know, we see that whenever we meet the adult Henry for the first time at Idlewild Airport in uh, 63, we're panning up from those olive gator skin loafers and then over his whole gray silk or shark skin suit. And then that, that uh, black and gray striped knit shirt, which, you know, I, t I know we talked to Scott Fraser Simpson about his recreation for that. Yeah. And then, yeah, I, I, but with that uh, era too, like we're still seeing lots of silk suits and knits, but also the younger guys are introducing more of their own like tough guy styles there. Like leather jackets are really starting to get big as we see in the 60s. Like in the 50s, they're wearing windbreakers just like a lot of guys did then. But then in the 60s, it's these leather jackets. Like uh, when Ray Liotta's, you know, furious, he gets out of his car, he's got on that brown leather blazer with the 38 tucked in his waistband. And he just, he looks, you know, really, that, that's like what we associate now is like a really mobbed up look. You know, it's not something we would have seen on one of Pauly's guys in the 50s. Uh, it, but it's kind of like that gateway into what it would get into in the 70s that has a lot more leather, the bigger collars, a lot of the more like disco era fashions. Uh, and at that point, it seems like the guys in Pauly's crew really don't have that much of like a sartorial influence anymore. You know, there's, there's always these groups of guys that want to dress like the neighborhood guys they saw growing up. Uh, but, you know, dressing up seems to mean a lot more just like suits and sport jackets with open collars. Uh, and then dressing down at this point, you know, it's not even just leather jackets, you know, track suits, which I think uh, in context got big after the 72 Olympics. Like we see Henry wearing that, that navy colored Adidas track suit in prison. And, and of course, yeah. About that, let me jump in. So I yeah, yeah. saw on your site that there's a company that claims that they produced or they, they supplied that. Do you remember that? <laughs> I know that you put, you might be like me where you write it down, post it on a blog and then go, that's that done. <laughs> I wrote it down in my diary. So I wouldn't have. <laughs> but uh, I'll give you a minute anyway to catch up on that. But Ken, I was going to uh, turn to you towards the shirts because, I mean, this is something you notice, I think, when you pay attention to menswear as opposed to when I was like 12, 13 watching this film. You know, I didn't pay any attention to collars or the clothes but you can't take your eyes off those collars. Yeah. And I noticed actually that Robert De Niro doesn't wear these collars. No, De Niro's <laughs> always in uh, more of a, like a point collar, like a traditional you know, uh, business shirt. But 
uh, everybody else, uh, it, to your point, Nick, th they all seem to emulate um, Pauly and the, the points on, her, uh, on the spear point are, are about four inches long. They come down so far and, and some of them are so sharp, some of them are rounded. Um, they were all made custom uh, for the movie by uh, Geneva Custom Shirts here in New York. Uh, I'm in New York. <laughs> um, and uh, basically Scorsese was so hands-on on the movie. Um, he grew up around a lot of wise guys in Little Italy. Um, and this is a look that he remembered. You don't see it very much in photographs, but he insisted um, from his own personal recollection that a lot of these guys were wearing these, these, you know, these, uh, uh, these collars with no tie space that went down so far. They might have just been point collars that were too big, <laughs> but uh, in his recollection, they looked like spear points. So, so many of the guys are wearing them. Um, and Pesci is uh, probably best remembered for them. He, he'd also worn them, uh, you know, in Raging Bull. He continued to wear them in the casino. Um, I, I, and I don't know if you guys remember the Wise Guy music video uh, from like 1998 he put out. I'll send you guys the link. Oh, okay, I'll go see that. Uh, he continued on, you know, anytime he was trying to get in that mindset, he kind of wore that same style of shirt. Um, That's interesting. Uh, the other, but uh, more unsung, there are some other interesting collars in the film too. There's the the kind of Lido collar, um, which is more, you know, like, um, more like, it looks more like resort wear or something. It's rounded. It, it, it's a, uh, it's a one piece collar that goes around. Um, when Henry's meeting Karen's mother for the first time and she buttons up his shirt to mm. hide the cross, that's what he's wearing there. And then later he's talking to Polly about um, Billy Bat's disappearance, right? And he's got an enormous one in that scene. Um, yeah. Again, just something you don't see very often, very specific to the time period and to, you know, Scorsese's recollection of what guys wear. That's interesting. I took a couple of screen grabs because I just watched the film and sent it to uh, Matt Spacer and a couple of guys in, in, the, in the network. And I said, are these ever going to make a comeback? And Matt goes, I hope not. <laughs> and I, was like, I don't know. I kind of like them. I think uh, I'd like to at least try them on. I mean, do you know anything about Geneva shirts, Nick? I mean, I reached out to him just before the show, but you know, obviously last minute, I haven't heard anything back. But uh, are these guys on your radar at all? Yeah, I know. That I feel like they have a, a pretty strong um, just provenance with other productions they've made shirts for. Like, I, I think most recently, well, I, I think they've worked a bunch with Scorsese. I believe they did a lot of shirts for The Irishman and uh, Boardwalk Empire, too. So, I mean, those, those are ones I'm familiar with just from researching for... Um, just other, you know, productions that I would have written about on my site, but yeah. Right. Yeah, I've, um, I thought it was interesting in the DVD commentary, they talk about Scorsese's mum, or it might be both his mum and dad that would iron press the collars for these shirts because they were the only ones that knew how to do it. And I yeah. know it just, and they, there's uh, someone that mentions, I think it's Nicholas Pledgey, the writer, that says the greatest character in this film is actually Scorsese because it's more his personality in the film than any other character. And I was thinking, yeah, that's kind of a, a true thing. But then I just rewatched it. And some of the scenes that are just so slick, like the, the killing of Stax, mm -hmm. where he kills him through the back of the head. And then as they narrate over it, you see the scene pan from another angle where he's killing him in slow motion. I thought that's so not only badass, but just such a good way to allow room for the narration to happen. So they have a lot of freeze frames where they they stop it, and then obviously Ray Liotta will come in and talk about it. Um, and I think it's just a clever trick. And probably the first time I've seen it, I know he referenced a couple of Italian films that were his influence for stuff like that. But I mean, that obviously went on then for Tarantino and every. British gangster flick after that, there was always a stop, a freeze frame, an insert of a credit. Um, but yeah, I digress. Uh, did you, Nick, did you notice any, I guess like as the characters progress through the film, like the costumes, did they follow a certain story arc along with the characters? And did you see that reflect the characters in any way? Yeah, I, I think, uh, yeah, I, I think that there's, certain people that are more like consistent with their wardrobes like i know we, we had mentioned you know like joe pesci as tommy he does seem kind of stuck in the past you know he's a guy that's got something to prove his whole life he's going to dress the same as the guys that he idolized growing up in the 60s uh, you know or growing up in the 50s and 60s so 
you know, decades beyond that, whenever everyone else might be updating their wardrobes, you know, he's still wearing the same kind of silk suits and sport jackets with, again, those big uh, gangster collars and ties. Uh, and, and, I, and I think that there's, there's tribute paid to him kind of living in this anachronism because even that final shot of the movie that, you know, pays tribute to the great train robbery, it's, you know, it shows that, you know, just kind of a, that, that throwback reference there and they show Tommy wearing, you know, pork pie hat, uh, you know, far after that would have been a fashionable thing to wear. So, yeah, I think the fact that he's so rooted, uh, I think that shows his, his journey there. Um, yeah, I feel like you see Henry and Jimmy and Polly dress a lot more casually more often. Mm. Um, you really only, I, I can only picture one time when you see Tommy really like in knitwear when he's waiting at the airport in that first shot in 63. But most of the time he's dressed to the nines. He's got the tie on, he's got the silk suit on. He's always kind of, I don't know if it's in character, it's just who he is. He's always that gangster. He, he's never, he's always working. He's always dangerous. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah that's a good point. And, and he wants people to know he is. Because um, yeah, then Jimmy, on the other hand, you know, he has his moments. He has... Uh, like, you know, that, that like black and white shadow plaid jacket and, you know, a couple other things that, that he wears that are a little loud, but otherwise, you know, even he, he kind of takes on this role as like the, the elder statesman of the mob, you know, like he, he frequently wears suits and sport jackets, but, you know, being this, you know, kind of Irish outsider uh, to the Italian mob, he doesn't really keep to their uniform, you know, it's, there's mm. a lot more, uh, you know, other than the, like the blue Dupioni silk, whenever he's introduced, it's a lot of muted uh, conservative cloths like, you know, gray worsted, uh, brown window paint, or, or, you know, a lot of kind of tasteful stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. I think if you look at Henry's art too, you know, there's obviously the scene right in the beginning in 55 where he gets his first uh, double-breasted uh, suit there. You know, his mother says he looked like a gangster, right? And then you get to Idle Wild, and he's made it more personal. You know, he's got the, uh, you know, he's got the, uh, the black and white shirt, and it's getting the whole outfit there. But as time goes on, it, it's um, it's not even more casual. It's almost like more scattered the way he's dressed. Um, like he's got that beautiful camel hair, double breasted coat that he wears a lot. Um, you know, in the in the later seventies. But there's a moment where he's wearing it over like um, like a Tony Soprano style like zip leather jacket. Um, He's just getting in and out of the cold. It's just like this weird, you know, hodgepodge of stuff. Uh, and then, you know, in 1980, obviously, when he's coked up and he's driving all around and he's manic, um, the shirt, he just swallows him up. It's, it's too baggy on him. He's put in, like, no effort uh, to his look. He's still, I mean, he's still better than most guys on the street. But, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, it's, it's nowhere near the effort that he was putting in in the 60s. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. He he basically just goes off the rails, his clothes, he's barely buttoning his shirts. I think the first sign that you notice is where he can't really do his tie properly. He's saying, right, I'm going to be late. And Nick, I think you wrote about this in the blog. You just see him like almost throw a knot, like a blade over it. Um, which, and also there's actually funky things going on in this film with ties. So like the first scene where this gangster comes out of the cab, he's wearing like a tie in a cross form. Mm -hmm. If you, it's, it's going to take a sharp eye, but they pan up from his feet and then he's got his tie tied in like a crossway. And then you see um, Henry Hill wear that same mm -hmm. as well when he's like uh, playing poker with the guys just before a spider gets shot. So he's, he's almost hit that peak there and it's, they're using the, the way they wear their ties to portray that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's a great observation, too, because I think that, that points out, too, like, you know, we see Henry looking out the window, he sees that guy stepping out of a Cadillac, and that's like, yeah, that's the epitome of success, and then when he reaches that point, you know, it's, I think, 1970 at that card game, and he's doing the same thing, because he, that's what he saw, that's what he knows, you know, these guys are supposed to dress like. Yeah. Uh, do you think that this, I, I mean, the film's often cited as a classic, but do you think the clothes are classic? Or are they of their time? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I, yeah, I, I love the clothes. And I, I think they're definitely formative. My interest in men's clothing and movie fashion. I would have, hesitate to call them generally classic. Um, or maybe they're, you know, kind of classic, but at least not timeless. Because, uh, yeah, I don't even know if, if they are so rooted in that, that time as much as they are of just, like, mob culture of the mid-20th century, you know? Yeah. Uh, I think there's a difference between like timeless versus like time specific or just old, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's, it, and the timelessness you're talking about is kind of the difference between like style and fashion. 
Um, yeah. I, like you were mentioned before, Pete, like I don't think a lot of these looks are coming back, right? Mm -hmm. There are some looks that really work. Um, you know, uh, again, the, the, the blue silk suit that uh, De Niro wears when he's first introduced, um, that's a wild suit. Like you couldn't wear that to a meeting, but it's always going to look bashful in style. Um, Knitted polos are coming back, right? I mean, Scott Frazier is making an entire collection of them. So I think maybe there's a, a reverence for that kind of look, but, and I don't think those colors either came before or after. So perhaps they're not going to make a, a comeback anytime soon, but I'm yeah. just wondering about the the kind of the cut of the suit and like the, the trousers are of full length, the jacket's a little bit longer. Do you think, and maybe actually, sorry, let me just dial back one. When we say classic, I have this conversation with Space all the time and say, well, you can say classic, but a lot of people will have, their mind will go to different films when you talk about classic. Someone might think of Fred Astaire, someone might think of Cary Grant, and these are all kind of Connery. These will be different decades. They're classic films, they'll look, classically presented in them but what is a is a classic cut nick i'll throw that mind fart over to you <laughs> yeah i mean i, I it, it is easy to for me to equate classic and uh timeless uh, it, I, and I, I think i'm probably one of those where when when you say the word classic my mind goes to you know, when thinking about suits, I go to that, you know, the, the golden era, the 30s and the 40s and what those cuts look like. And, but again, that's, that's what I like to wear. Like that, there might be people that, that prefer, you know, the, the looks and cuts of the early 60s and to them that is the most classic thing. But I know like whenever I get ones made for me and I, I think too that that's, that's more flattering for like my, my body type, my head size is just like that, that 30s and 40s, you know, wide shoulders. Mm -hmm. uh, tapered waist, you know, either, you know, wide peak lapels, whether it's on a double or single breasted jacket. Uh, but yeah, so I, I think expanding that definition, I think classic, uh, I, I, I think I, my mind loosely defines that as what looks good in any era. And so if I had to pick the most classic styles from Goodfellas, I would probably say overwhelmingly, like the knit shirts are probably like the most, um, the most classic piece, like you mentioned. Uh, and then taking it down on like a character level, I'd say, you know, Jimmy's probably the most like classic dresser. Uh, you mentioned the scene where <laughs> Henry broke his cherry and Jimmy's there to greet him. And he's dressed in like a gray wool suit, white shirt with an open collar that, you know, that's, that's 1955 there. And that, that's, you know, a look that would just look, look just as good 50 years later. Like it, it reminded me of, you know, George Clooney and Ocean's Eleven, which I know Ken is. Uh, familiar with I've, those styles. I've seen it a couple of times. Yeah, he actually he's dressed in that scene like he is in Heat. Uh, oh, mm, mm -hmm. It's a, yeah. just a plain gray, double-breasted suit, white shirt, no tie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Ken, what do you think about cla when your mind, when you hear the word classic, where does your mind go to, either in this film or outside of it? Now, for me, it's 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 similar to Nick. I think my definition might be a little broader. I might take it into kind of the mid '60s. Um, you know, so, you know, various lapel lengths and trouser fits and all that. But, um, like, I, I think that it really has to do with proportion and dressing to the body and all of that. So difference, as Nick was saying, like different styles, different um, uh, period trends uh, kind of attract different folks and work better on different people. Um, but what I think is really interesting about this film is that Scorsese had such a specific image in mind. Um, and, you know, it, it, and it's not just in the, it's not just in the main gangster characters either. It's like, um, uh, Karen's, uh, neighbor across the street is always dressed in like Lacoste, right? Mm. Um, this has this, you know, preppy kind of look to him. Um, the, uh, uh the guy that gets him into witness protection has a very buttoned down kind of Brooks Brothers look to him. Mm. All of the looks are pretty specific to the character. Mm. You can really tell who the wise guys are version the schnooks. Um, <laughs> And I digress here, but um, I think that there are definitely classic looks in here, but they're mixed in with a lot of kind of trendy, you know, doesn't translate well to another era. <laughs> yeah. I think this is one of those films where the director's just been a true visionary. And I heard that he like had all the songs mapped out in his mind like three years before he got around to filming this, which is kind of telling you how he he saw the film in his head and then goes, right, I've been thinking about this for so long. I know exactly what we're doing here. Um, so yeah, I, I, I agree. I think he's, he's had a huge influence and 
He obviously, uh, I don't know how big he was with the costume team or with the costume designer, Richard Bruno. I think he worked with him on four other films. Uh, you know, I know he did Color of Money with him before this and I think another couple of films. Yeah. I know Nick, he had at I? least worked on, I don't know, I don't think he was the lead costume designer for the others, but like he, he'd worked on New York, New York, Raging Bull and, and yeah, right. King Comedy and yeah. Did um, Armani make the suits for this film? I hadn't heard or hadn't gotten confirmation. Mm -hmm. I've, I read it on an article somewhere, but they didn't back it up. It was one of those blogs that goes, and obviously uh, Armani made suits. I'm like, where? <laughs> show me the data. <laughs> show me show me the labels. Yeah, so. I, I really doubt that. I feel like it's, uh, I feel like these are all custom pieces um, because Armani in 1990 wasn't making anything that really looked like anything. These characters are Not looking like period, I don't think. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, I I questioned that as well. I think they, they, these must have been handmade. Do you want to hear some uh, interesting shit from director's commentary? Always. Good. All right. So Scorsese told Karen <laughs> that she is the star of the movie, and when she heard that, she picked out all the clothes that she thought Elizabeth Taylor would wear. So uh, she had like in her mind's eye what a movie star would be. Mm. And actually, I think he refers to her like in the film. I just thought she goes, oh, she had these eyes. She looked like Liz Taylor. Yeah. So that kind of ties in. That was great. Um, and she was also told no blue jeans. School says he didn't want any blue jeans. So they compromised for some white jeans in one particular scene. Well, that's, that's in, that makes sense. And I, I feel like, too, that's something that that must be like a, you know, a, a, a mob role that kind of came out later. Because I know... It, Donnie Brasco, which I feel like is another movie that, you know, followed Goodfellas, kind of following the, the uh, template there. there. I think, you know, uh, Donnie Depp plays the mob and or the, the FBI informant who goes undercover as a mobster and Pacino kind of takes him under his wing and he tells him, you know, get rid of those blue jeans, you know, like this yeah. is or something like that. So. Oh, yeah, that's a great pull. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, some interesting shit from IMDb. <laughs> you see my research just went literally to IMDB <laughs> and uh, director's commentary um, according to Ray Lyo, uh, Martin Scorsese he was so involved in every detail of the cast's wardrobe that he tied Lyo's tie himself to make sure it was accurate for the film setting really good and every one of Robert De Niro's outfits had a watch and a pinky ring to go with it oh my god did I notice pinky rings all the way through this film? <laughs> I mean, that's a thing. That is a thing. I think actually there is one that is still out there uh, on prop store, one of the pinky rings. Oh, that would be cool. Because I always, uh, I always go looking to see what's actually out there, and the the weighing scales for the the heroin or the coke, whatever they're cooking up there, that's that's out there. <laughs> um, one of Henry Hill's original shirts. I don't know what the brand was, but I, I know he. He wore a lot of Brioni, I think, in his in his life. But I, I know he mentions it in in the book, at least. Like whenever he gets out of prison, he says he has like his four year old Brioni suit that he put back on. And is that Wise Guy the book or the one after? Yeah, yeah. Wise Guy, yeah, yeah. Because I've I've got to go. I tried to. It's not on Audible. So I tried to. Go, <laughs> I didn't have time to physically sit down and read it, so I I just I listened to the one that he did after. I can't remember the name of it, but I'm, I'm never mind. Yeah, I like. Um the costuming for Billy Bats, right? Like yeah. how anachronistic it is. He's got that stupid little mustache, <laughs> pencil pin mustache. Yeah. Pompadour and uh and the way he's dressed, it just, you know, it, it screams kind of like yeah. in the fifties, but you know, it's it's nineteen seventy now, so move on. <laughs> yeah, and I like that yeah, it is a variation of what, what everyone else is wearing, but it doesn't it doesn't look as good. It doesn't look as sharp, you know. Um, it, it looks like, you know, he'd he'd had that in the back of his closet just waiting for the day to celebrate getting out of prison. And then, yeah. And then, yeah, I mean, it looks a lot worse by the end of that night, but uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that was, that was um, fascinating because they used to be like a duo, didn't they? Uh, with the actor that played Billy Bats is Vince oh, yeah, someone. Yeah. Frank Vincent. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so they used to be like in a band doing duet or a comedy act doing duets. And then that's how he got him enlisted in the film because of the chemistry between the two. And so then he, he went on and did some stuff with Joe Pesci, yeah. Raging Bull before this. So hmm. Pesci beat the crap out of him in Raging Bull, right? And then in this, and then he got his own back in Casino. I think that's how it all wrapped up. Yeah. Yeah. That's a tough scene to watch, but that could be another podcast episode. Oh, yeah. I really want to do Casino. On my About page for the blog, I say my favorite style film is Casino. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, yeah, we've got to crack the nut on that one. <laughs> 
But uh, talking about actual props and costumes, Ken, if anything came up for auction today, oh, hold on, got a jingle. Edit. Ken, if anything came up for uh, auction today from the film, prop or costume, what would you go for? Uh, costume, I would go with De Niro's blue silk suit from the opening there. But I think topping everything prop wise would be Tommy's mother's painting. You know, one dog goes one way, one dog goes the other way. You know, nice. That was right here, prime placement. <laughs> nice. That was um, Nicholas Pileggi's mom that drew that, right? Is that right? Yeah, yeah, something like that. Uh, so yeah, that's a good, oh, good pull, good pull. I actually wouldn't mind. Uh, there's a company that paints imitation arts, and I think you can get those sort of paintings knocked up for a couple of hundred quid. So. I don't know if this is legal. Maybe I'll have to cut this out. But you know, have to. <laughs> so Anastasia said, "Look, what, what painting do you want? We're going to get one done." I was like, "Well, I want Lady in a Fan, the the Skyfall Magdalena painting, right? The one that um, appears in Skyfall. So we're probably going to get that done. But second on the list would definitely be that painting. That's a great shout, Ken. Nick, over to you. Uh, well, I, I I mean just to go back the, yeah the first time I watched Goodfellas I was in eighth grade and the moment that really sold me on it was that scene I talked about at Idlewild Airport in '63 uh, you know we go up from again those those olive gator skin loafers the gray suit and then uh, that black and gray striped knit shirt I I know that I spent you know probably 20 years of my life looking for a shirt like that first one I found was at the Macy's at the mall it was black and tan knit and it was you know it was it was it was a fine shirt but it wasn't the same one uh found this this one you know on amazon that, that kind of did it now i know scott has his but yeah i feel like if that came up for auction i'd i'd love to own the original so good shouts good pulls love it i think i'd go for murray's wig <laughs> <laughs> the one that he wears when de niro strangles him uh, and maybe Costume wise, I think I'd have to have, is it a gray plaid? The one that Tommy gets made in and ultimately kills him? Oh yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that, okay. I think it's like a, yeah, black and white blend plaid silk yeah. jacket, if I, yeah. I just think, cause he looks so good in that and his yeah. mum gives him that nice touching, I'm so proud of you, I love you, and like you look, he asks how do I look, doesn't he? I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. don't do any more religious paintings, please. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah I, with, with Tommy's jackets too, I feel like they always had like a, a little narrow gauntlet cuff on them, or at least a lot of them did, and I think that one was one of them too, that just yeah. little little touches like that that I like. I noticed on a, quite a few of the jackets that, they actually came up quite short. I thought that was to show off the cuffs and the cufflinks a lot yeah. more, but they, they always seem to just come up to, this is no good pod, podcasting, but just below the cuff when they were pointing at things or you know, laughing at things, you could always see the, the bling on the cufflinks on that. I noticed a lot, uh, watching it again, I noticed a lot more one button uh, jackets and, um, uh, and slanted um, you know, side pockets than I expected. But I guess that's to add a little bit of height. Um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Not, you know, I thought he was six two in the movie. I didn't really. Yeah, was he like five four or something? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Wears a lot of um, high heels, like myself. Oh, well, yeah, that's the thing. Yeah, Tommy. I think Tommy almost always wears like cowboy boots with his suits too. If you really see, so. Ah. Yeah, okay. yeah. yeah that's giving a little lift. I know there's a screen grab on your. <laughs> the one scene where Ray Lyo is in the wardrobe and he's talking to Karen off camera and he's tucking money or taking money out of his belt. So you can see the wardrobe. There are shoe boxes up there. And I think you've even screen grabbed this Nick on your site. There's uh, I think there's Bali up there, uh, Salvador Ferragamo. I mean, these are kind of just boxes and brands. I don't know if they're actually in the movie or not. But. I know. Yeah. I'd, I'd hope so. I feel like that, you know, they have that attention to detail where they would put that in, but yeah, I, I love that shot of the closet and I just, you know, I, I love all the costumes that we do see, but there's just some of those like jewel tone suits, like would have loved to seen like, I know there's like a, a, a deep red one there and you know, a lot of greens and blues. And it's like, oh, I wish we'd had the time to see a couple more of those in play too, but. Yeah, that would have been cool. I guess, I guess that's what casinos for. That's where all those colors really come out to shine. Yeah. Oh, I can't wait to do casino. <laughs> I'm going to have to uh, drink the rest of this wine, put that on, and that'll be a life, I think. Anyway, <laughs> gents, thanks so much for, for coming on. Uh, it must be around about lunchtime for you guys, Nick? A uh, little after here, yeah. Yeah, Ken? All right. 
All right, James. Well, thanks for taking time out during the day. Bampstyle.com at Bampstyle, the place to catch up with Nick. Sure, you know that. Ken is over at Oceanographer on Instagram, and we'll leave a link in the show notes so you can catch up with them, gents. Always great catching up with you guys, and uh, until next time.